Welcome to Create, Build, Manage, the Entrepreneur's Toolbox. Welcome to Create, Build, Manage on Biz TV. I'm Kelly Phillips. Today, I'm joined by Susie Tomanchuk, host of Biz TV's Adopting a Negotiator Mindset. Susie is a seasoned expert negotiator who inspires individuals to embrace their voices, navigate their desired paths, and achieve unparalleled success in both business and life. Stay with us. We'll be right back with more Create, Build, Manage. guest specializes in helping business leaders navigate their personal and professional lives by adopting a negotiator mindset. Please welcome Susie Tom and Chalk. And Susie, tell me how this is done. I think we all could use help in a negotiator mindset. Yes, I, I totally agree. I concur. Completely. I have found that people understand that we negotiate all the time, but until they really are intentional about it, I hear people all the time go, but we really do. We negotiate all the time. And I just, I am really bold on saying that if we adopt a negotiator mindset and really take those skills and strategies that great negotiators use, we can be better leaders, better humans, better business owners, better partners all around. So I think it's a great way to just maneuver life. Why is silence such a powerful tool? I have a hard time with that. Do you know that um, we listen the least to the people that we know the best because we get used to their cadence. We get used to how they answer things. We get used to what they ask us. And when we practice silence, that interrupts those patterns. So that's one reason why silence is so powerful. But just like you said, it makes us uncomfortable. So what silence does is, is it makes us think. It creates this space to give us that opportunity to fill in the blanks. So in a negotiation, when you practice silence after you've made an offer or after the other party has made an offer, you allow this lingering to happen for somebody to fill in more information that might be valuable to you. It also allows the other party to share something that may not even be intentional, but something that is valuable that they need to say. So silence is really powerful. And I find that most people say it's something that's difficult to do, especially in a high stake situation, because we get so when we're in high stakes, we're emotional and we have to kind of think out loud and silence is difficult to do, but it gives the space to the other party. Well, and I think so many times people look at silence as a weakness. Um, you want to fill that dead air. Um, but like you said, that's the time where you might, might find out more information. Are there some other things that are key components in negotiating that you can share with us? Absolutely. Uh, I think one thing that seems so just obvious is that when we move into any situation, whether it's high stakes, when, when high stakes is something that's just important to us and high stakes is different for all of us, when we're really clear about our goal and we take time to, to be really intentional about what our end game is or our best possible outcome, that allows us to move for it move toward it and get what we need. And that can be such a, a missed opportunity. It sounds so simple. And then the other thing is just framing to the other party what that ask is or what your goal is. When we frame it, because we're so in our own head, we're so in our own scenario, that when you frame it, what you're doing is you're allowing that other side of the table to see it from your perspective. You're giving them the context to make the right decision, the best decision for you and the situation. Um, and so framing 
and being really clear about where you're going, I think are two great opportunities to practice adopting a negotiator mindset in any situation that we face. Now, some people may say negotiation is manipulation, but those two are completely different. Can you tell us why and how they are different? Yeah. Negotiation is just one of those words. And I think we all have a different relationship with it because in the past, we may have felt manipulated by somebody because we weren't sure what they were thinking. We were, they we felt like they got one over on us. And so we first need to get really comfortable with that word negotiation. You know, when I say to a peer or a colleague of mine, let's negotiate our priorities. I'm not saying, let me take advantage of you. I'm saying, I'm interested in what's important to you. So let's talk about it to get the right balance. But when we don't understand or we don't open up that dialogue, in a negotiation, we don't have all the information. And so that can feel manipulative. We can feel like we, we're not sure. So the best way to get um, that feeling kind of set to the side is to be really clear what's important to you. I often tell people, understand what your best case scenario would be and what is your walk away and have a plan for that. And if you don't get in that zone, then walk away because the last thing you want is a negotiator hangover. And so I think manipulative comes with that lack of clarity or lack of intention to really articulate in a powerful way what you want and what is best for both parties when that's possible. Can you share a, a memorable negotiation challenge and how you navigated it using your expertise and your own negotiator's mindset? Sure. I remember I negotiated a pretty big deal. I used to work for a, a Fortune 20 company and we were doing a renewal with a, a big client. And we both knew that the services that we were providing were not as valuable as the beginning of the contract, but we still want to retain the same revenue. And it was really important to, uh, for us to do that. And so I had to go in and do the whole pitch. And then I had to say the, the, the words and you get all of this for $8.5 million. And I remember the biggest challenge was just to sit in silence. Uh, there was so much um, negotiation thoughts going through my head because I knew the other party. I understood all the pieces of the deal. And it was hard for me to say it with, with the confidence I needed to, and then practice silence to just allow the response to happen. And we ended up really coming to a great, even though you may think we wouldn't have, we came to a great resolution because what happened was that unlocked the conversation to really figure out how do we provide value that was different than what we were providing before. And setting that number really allowed us a place to move into that dialogue. And so a lot of times, because we're so constricted by nerves or intimidation that we decrease our ability to think creatively. And really what you want to do is go into any negotiation with a lot of objectivity and clarity. And when you show that willingness to the other party, that creates that same experience for them as well. And the more um, clarity, the more creativity both parties can gain so that you can come to a solution that works best. So many times I think people go into meetings and they think my way is the only way. So if you, what you're saying is if you go into meetings with an open mind and you both listen to one another, then you can both end up coming out feeling like you succeeded. And, you know, I went to Harvard for a negotiation leadership course. And this one piece of advice, to your point, made such an impression on me is that they said that when you consider the interests of the other party, even for 30 seconds before you walk in, you will create measurably better results. And that's because we are so in our head. We're looking about how do I want to frame this? How do I want to walk through this? But when you can kind of 
tilt or you move the chair to understand what it feels like to sit in that other seat, you open up the words and the position to help the other party know that you are interested in what's important to them, that you considered what's important to them. And that just creates a great collaboration in any negotiation. Susie, if you don't mind, we've got to take a quick break, but we've got lots more questions when we come back. back with Susie Tomachok to talk a little bit more about negotiations. And Susie, if you will, give us a little background on you as an executive and how you saw negotiation playing out your in your everyday role. Yeah. So I would see negotiation and these were big deals where the person across the table was a CTO, a CEO, and I had to really learn to negotiate. But really what hit me was when I walked out of that room and the negotiation with my peer who asked for everything, who advocated for himself, for his team, the meeting before the meeting, they always considered his interests. They always knew that Susie would just take what we gave to her. So I saw the power as a peer in an organization and how important it is for us to advocate for ourselves in creating opportunities for development in our leadership, in um, advocating for uh, our our team in everything in the in the hallways. But then at home, my three daughters. Uh, I talk about in my book about the target strategy. When they would go to Target, they would consider the relationship equity, who had the best relationship equity to, with me to pick the thing that they wanted to leave Target with. They would think about the timing associated to the less stress that I would be in. So they'd wait till the end to come to me with the, their their want. They framed the ask in a way that made sense to me they would pick two things and make one more educational and one not. Like they were very creative with how they moved into getting what they wanted. And it was many years until I figured out one of my daughters, once she was a teenager, admitted to the target strategy. And I wrote about it in my book. And now she's 30. And she said, Mom, that story was right. We did actually do that. I'm like, I know you told me finally. But it happened in my my life here. And I, I think that when my daughters were younger, I realized that responsibility about what they were seeing, what I was teaching them. And so I think for individuals to understand that using these strategies in every day allows you to be just a better person because you're considering your interests, you get clear about what you want, you're considering the other side and what's important to them. And you're advocating along the way. And so I feel like it just kind of opens up this other dimension that it, once we see it, we can't unsee it. And it's not that in every situation we're going to go into, we're going to try to take advantage, but it's like making that choice of what's important to us and being aware of that. You mentioned your book. Tell us the name of it and how you came to write it and what the processes were. Sure, sure. So the book is called um, Everyday Negotiation Without Manipulation. And I wrote it because I was helping a C-level person negotiate her salary in a new position. And we talked a, a few coaching sessions. And, and at the end of one, she goes, can you slow down? Can you write down you know, how to frame this? The, the words I need to use, rewrite a book. And that's really was the genesis. A few years later, after I wrote it, I didn't even know her that well. I said, thank you for making this happen for me. And so I just realized that this concept was just so in my everyday and it wasn't available to other people. And I thought, you know, this is a great tool for us to use and really get comfortable with using the term negotiation. Let's turn that around and make it a really positive thing about understanding what's important to you considering that moving in and being really clear about what we want to. So my book is 
it talks about a bunch of stories that um, were associated to my professional career. Um, I hear people say it, I made it really um, just from my perspective, it's just my life and how I, I had to learn along the way to be a good negotiator in my business or for the business. And uh, along the way, I just learned to take on these great skills and strategies to apply in everything I do. And it sounds like uh, it works well if your daughters are even implementing it, which can be difficult in a household to, to have everybody as a negotiator. Uh, what's the connection that you see <laughs> between true. leadership and negotiation strategies? So I talk to a lot of teams about the idea of being really clear about what's high stakes to you. And like you mentioned, you know, a meeting uh, to, for an executive could be high stakes. Maybe you're not prepared. Maybe you don't have the experience. Maybe there's somebody in the room that you don't know or that you have history with that isn't always positive. That can make us, it could feel like high stakes for us, depending on what that circumstance is. And I feel like when we get really clear about that and even be able to say to a colleague, hey, listen, this is high stakes for me. I want to make sure that my points are clear. Can you have my back and make sure that I you reiterate what I say or you help make my point or ask good questions to really pull out the best of me? That's using the relationships around you to help you be better. And then you're teaching people around you to do that as well. So I think the key is understanding what is high stakes for you and being aware of that, even a kind of low stakes using air quotes situation where you just think it's a normal, you know, go in one meeting to another as we all do professionally these days. And all of a sudden, something unexpected happens and all of a sudden it becomes high stakes. Even having that awareness in that moment to go, okay, I better slow down. This means I might not be as clear headed as I need to be. Do I need to take some time to kind of settle in? Or what do I need to do to be have situational awareness to make sure that I'm moving through this in the best way for the best possible outcome for me? And we've talked a lot about how negotiations really help in business, but they also have to help you in everyday life. Can you give me some examples of, of how negotiating? I mean, you mentioned your daughters uh, first, but have there been some other instances personally that, that you've witnessed that negotiating and knowing how to do it has helped? Yeah, absolutely. You know, this happens to me all the time. I might profess to just always have this confidence, but just a few months ago, I was, I had talked to a, a client of mine who I've worked with a long time and we were renegotiating my, my, um, my deal, let's just say for uh, the upcoming year. And it felt really personal to me. And I threw out a big number, um, to cover the whole year. And she was like, okay, that sounds great. Can you put that in an email? And I'm like, sure. So we get off the phone and I write it all down. It still feels, even though she already said yes, it still <laughs> felt really, oh, that's a big number to me. And so I wrote the email and walked away because that I know that, you know, what triggers me is in the moment thinking about that. I came back and read it. And then I couldn't press send because I still was in my own head about it. So I, I delayed the response and I sent the email to go early in the morning the next day because it, it kind of felt not personal. It didn't feel like I was pushing the button. It was so funny. It's we negotiation happens in here so much to us. You know, it's we're our own worst enemies sometimes. And so early in the morning, I was about to go to a workout, do a workout, and she responded and says, Looks great. Can you just add in this one little thing to it? And I was so excited by her response that she was okay with it that I wanted to respond right away and say, yes. And not only that, I'll do this, this, and this, you know, because my emotions were so high. And I thought, you know what? Go do your workout, come back and respond. And so I came back and I just wrote, sounds good. I am happy to add in that other, you know, element to our deal. And so just through that, that illustration, it shows you that we get in our own way and it, it is something we have to have awareness around so that when we are triggered, 
by something, what do we need to do to kind of get our objectivity back so we make great decisions? Now, Susie, I know you mentioned your bo your book, but can do you do talks? Can people get in touch with you other ways besides just reading your book? Sure. I have a podcast and a, a show on Biz TV called Adopting a Negotiator Mindset and Le Leaders with Leverage. Um, people can go to Su uh, negotiationlove.com and find all about me. I have an online course and I do a lot of speaking on these concepts of negotiation. I love to spread the word about how we all need to get really familiar and comfortable with this word negotiation and how it makes us better Profession, professionally and personally. And just embracing that is something I want to make sure more and more groups are aware of. Susie, Tom and Chalk, thank you so much. Hopefully we can all adopt that negotiator mindset. Thanks for joining me today for Biz TV's Create, Build, Manage. Episodes of Create, Build, Manage are available on demand on the free Biz TV streaming app. Visit watch.biztv.com and get Biz TV programming anytime, anywhere. Stay tuned to Biz TV for more stories that educate, enlighten, and empower.